Thank you very much, Nicholas, for your nice introduction. Thank you for the invitation to join this Sano World Seminars. Really excited to be here and talk about my group research on cyanobacteria and fatty acids. I will hope that today I will share a bit about how cyanobacteria are quite unique in the way they deal with fatty acids. And I'll start that by showing you a couple of cyanobacterial secondary metabolites. And in pink, you have their moieties that come from fatty acids. We'll see that they are not something that you would typically recognize as a fatty acid, as canonical way you look at fatty acid, but you will recognize as well that they have these stretches of carbons and hydrogens. And then you have modifications. You have often halogenations and saturations, you have aromatic rings that are formed from fatty acids. So cyanobacteria really not only incorporate many fatty acids into their secondary metabolism, more than any other of rich secondary metabolite producers, but they also modify them to an extent that's quite unusual. And we are interested in this, and I will tell you why later. This diversity of fatty acid containing molecules reflects a large number of different enzymes that are able to pick up fatty acids from primary metabolism and direct them into secondary metabolism. The most common ones are these fatty acyl AMP ligases, which activate fatty acids as thioesters bound to acyl carrier proteins. And as you'll see later, we'll have a lot of those in cyanobacterial genomes. This is kind of the hallmark of cyanobacterial fatty acid glycation. You also have type 3 PKSs that are able to pick fatty acids from primary metabolism and modify them. We have dialkyl resource, you know, forming enzymes like uh, DARB that can create cyclic moieties coming from two fatty acids. And you have other types like lipoyl transferases and NS transferases, quite a diverse arsenal of fatty acid incorporating enzymes. And if you look at cyanobacterial genomes, we have more than one of these enzymes per genome, and this includes the large amount of prochlorococcus, necococcus genomes. So in cyanobacteria, they are very rich in secondary metabolites, like for example, strains belonging to Nostocales or Oscillatorialis, you often have many of these fatty acid incorporating enzymes. So this is interesting to us because this is quite different from what happens in other organisms. And we'll talk about reasons why that might happen later. Why are we particularly interested in fatty acid incorporation and modification? Well, fatty acids are these very barren compounds that have very boring alkyl stretches that are quite indistinguishable. We cannot really distinguish one carbon from the next. They are just stretches of carbons that may be a bit longer, a bit shorter, but the only functionality that you have there is the carboxylate group. And in general, these are molecules that are not considered particularly interesting or exciting. But there are some interesting properties that come from adding a fatty acyl moiety to a compound, for example. You can have increased toxicity through interaction with membranes. For example, biofilms are regulated by this kind of fatty acid containing secondary metabolites, where the fatty acids can act as prodrugs, keeping a molecule from being toxic or directing the molecule to a specific subcellular compart and then being cleaved off to release the toxic compound. They can also be used for anchoring secondary metabolites to the membrane. And in general, there's interest in understanding the properties that fatty acyl moieties confer to compounds and actually engineering that. Because most of cyanobacterial secondary metabolites are still unknown from what we know from genome data, we know from all these enzymes that incorporate fatty acids, we know that there's a lot of these compounds that have lipid tails that we still don't know. And because of these properties, they might be bioactive. So there's a strong motivation to find this kind of mold. The other motivation for studying them from our perspective is that because cyanobacteria can modify these fatty acyl moieties with extreme selectivity, this is important for biocatalysis. For example, in the screen, you can see that we have here a sketch in which a specific carbon is modified by an enzyme. As you saw in the structures I showed you, all those modifications, they occur in a specific carbon and usually with a specific orientation. So they are regio and they to select. And this is quite important for biocatalysis because right now chemists cannot mimic this kind of selective modification in the fumarole. There's no reagent that can select between, for example, this carbon and this carbon. But cyanobacterial enzymes are quite capable of doing it. So this has potential industrial interest. We're interested in this kind of fatty acid incorporation, both from the discovery of new natural products perspective and from the perspective of finding new enzymes that can modify these moieties. And I will try to give you a couple of examples from our books, one on each of these motivations. The one particular thing about cyanobacteria that is kind of cryptic in the literature is that they seem to be lacking fat oxidation pathway. 
cyanobacteria have an extensive membrane system with many fatty acyl groups, but they don't seem to be able to degrade them for energy, at least using that beta oxidation pathway that we all learn by chemistry which is exemplified here, which usually commits the fatty acids to degradation through generation of a thioester with coenzyme A. And then there's two carbon degradation rounds that release this took away and energy. So cyanobacteria, from what we've collected in the literature and also the analysis we've done recently, most cyanobacteria seem to lack entirely the beta oxidative path in their genomes. And some of them seem to have almost full, but very few cyanobacteria. So this was interesting to us because we imagined that we could probably exploit this to discover new compounds that include the fatty acids. For example, the method that we thought about would involve supplementation of cyanobacteria with labeled fatty acids, in this case, the germ label fatty acids, which you have here as yellow spheres. And so if we think about E. coli that has a beta oxidative pathway, you would supplement the Nikolai culture. And then when you analyze their lipids in the CMS, you would see a version that it would incorporate the whole D11 label coming from C6. But you would also see a version that had lost these two carbons and then was further elongated again. So you would have only this label here. And you would also see the version that lost the extra two carbons and then was elongated again. And you will see a version without any digerons. And eventually we'll see some scrambling. So a bit of some dead runs showing up here and there because they still go away, which is released that oxidation will circulate through pathways and show up eventually many metabolites. On the other hand, if you thought about cyanobacteria, if you supplemented them with the same germ labeled fatty acid because of the lack of that oxidative pathway, it would only see the intact label in the lips. So we thought that we'll exploit this for discovery of natural products, as I'll shoot a couple of slides ahead. We first tested this. So you have E. coli here on the top, then E. coli expressing cyanobacterial acylase P synthase to make sure that longer fatty acids can get important to the cell. And then you have three different cyanobacteria. And what we saw is, for example, when we supplement these cultures with exonoic acid fully labeled with deuteriums, only in cyanobacteria can we see the labeled versions of the lipids. This is a phospholipid. Kind of the same is seen for longer fatty acids, although, for example, for C16, we can actually see the intact label also in E. coli, but that's because they can directly incorporate it into lipids. But in cyanobacteria, we'll always see the label that we export. So this kind of told us that if we supplement cyanobacterial cultures with uh, the germ-labeled fatty acid, we will see the intact label on the lipids that compose their membranes. But of course, we were interested in finding new secondary metabolites. And the strategy would be something like this. You would supplement the cyanobacterium, for example, exonoic acid fully labeled with a tear. Then you will have activation as an acyl-ACP thioester. And then elongation through the regular fatty acid biosynthesis pathway until it reached the size that was recruited for secondary metabolism. And that would eventually show up in the MS analysis, that secondary metabolite will show up in a comparison between labeled and non-labeled versions, in which in the supplemented situation, you would see a mass shift. And that would tell us this compound incorporates a fatty acid. That would mean that most of the lipidome that incorporates fatty acids would be labeled. And then we would just have to filter out the primary lipids and get the secondary metabolites. So that's what we did. We found a couple of compounds. I'm going to tell you about the ones we found in Fischerella. Initially, for a proof of concept, we knew that this Fischerella PCC9431 was producing hapalosin A. So we saw hapalosin A being labeled. Now I'll explain very briefly this. So here you have extracted chromatogram. So it's a chromatogram just for a specific mass. And we have in gray the control situation and in red the supplemented situation with the traded fatty acid. And then we have the extracted mass for the non-labeled compound and then the expected labeled compound. We not only would see hapalosin A labeled, which is this one comes here, that shouldn't see in the control situation, but we also found another set of related compounds with similar masses and similar retention times that were hapalosin analogs. So these were the first hapalosin analogs to be reported. But this served mostly as a push of cancer. When we went deeper into the data for the cyanobacterium, we also saw three compounds, same things here, black is control, red is supplemented situation, and we always compare both. And sometimes we see these masses that are heavier that correspond to incorporation of the tears. And we saw these were three compounds that were related, but they had nothing to do with the hapalosis that we saw earlier. 
So this told us that whatever these compounds were, they were incorporating the label coming from hex and white acid. So we isolated them and in structural sedation, they were novel molecules that had a long out chain and had several modifications. And it's sure all A, B, and C. The difference between them is halogenation here lacking, and in this case, hydroxylation lacking. So when we look with detail to these molecules, you will immediately realize that there's uh, extensive modification of the fatty acid moiety that gets into the mold. On the one hand, we have this gem dichlorovinylidine, which is quite rare and only found in semiconductor secondary metabolites. We have this regio and stereoselective coordinations, what I was telling you about, these modifications that we are really interested in, which can activate what is a completely unactivated CH bond in a regio and stereoselective way. We have this pendant allyl alcohol, which is also something entirely new in natural problems. And this portion does not come from fatty acid, it's also new. So this molecule is extremely interesting from a structural perspective. It has a lot of novelty. However, the most interesting thing, actually, we realized later, is that if we count the carbons from where the carboxylate will be, which is here, all the way down to the end of the chain, we have a count of 15 carbons. So 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15. And although there is C15 in some cyanobacteria, it's not a very abundant fatty acid. And we are used to seeing the corporations of even chain fatty acids into all. So we were very curious about this. Also because there were two pendant carbons here that we didn't know where they were coming from. So the first thing we did was try to find out where these carbons were coming from. And we supplemented this Fischerella string with methionine that was labeled in all three carbons of the methyl group and of the three that you and as we expected, we saw incorporation to the N-methyl group. So this is typically coming from acid and zone methionine. And we also saw incorporations into this portion. This was interesting. And this left extra carbon to be assigned because we expected all this 15 to come from a fatty acid. So we supplemented the same string, this time with hexadecanoic acid. So C16, but fully labeled with carbon 13. And when we saw where they ended up, we saw that they ended up here. So the 15 carbons, as we expect, plus this extra one. So this is extremely unusual. And it means that by a mechanism that we still don't know and we are studying, the C16 chain of hexadecanoic acid is rearranged and extrudes one car in the middle of the chain. So this is something that's entirely new. And this is the kind of things that we are actually looking for when we study this kind of fatty acid incorporation in education. So structural novelty usually brings enzymatic novelty. And now we're really interested in finding out what is going on here. But it's a type of functionalization that has not been reported yet. And it might be very interesting to generate structures from linear alpha chains. The next story I want to tell about starts with an already known molecule, moculin A. I'm Hope that at least some of you have seen this structure. This is very interesting and unique among all natural products because it contains a one, two, three oxidizing ring, which is this one here. And we have no idea of how it's made or the biosynthesis of course, but we do have some hints that there might be fatty acids involved. There's this C30 alkyl chain, and this part here could perhaps come from a short chain fatty acid. Well, this structure was reported by Pavel Fujek and his group in 2017, and they showed that it was quite cytotoxic. And this was also later shown by colleagues here at CMAR, and that it's very toxic to cancer cells, and it's acting through a new mechanism that is still to be discovered. We looked into inoculin A biosynthesis at the time Pavel and, and his group reported this molecule. They also used a comparative genomics analysis to implicate this locus here on the biosynthesis of inoculin A. Later, our colleagues here at CMAR found this molecule called porosphyrolactylates. And we found that this blue portion of the biosynthetic gene cluster or that was proposed to be involved in inoculin biosynthesis was actually being used to synthesize these porosphyrolactylates. And then later we found this composed molecule, which is inoculin kind of stitched together to the porosphyrolactylate, which we call inoculactylate. So our current hypothesis is that the whole biosynthetic gene cluster on the NOC locus is involved in synthesizing the inoculactylates. And this purple portion here is the biosynthetic gene cluster for inoculin A. So this was how my student Teresa started this project, trying to figure out first, because the ring structure, which is what's really novel. There's no precedence in terms of biosynthesis for this. We started by approaching how the carbon skeleton was formed so that we could move on and dissect the biosynthesis from there. We were curious about how the C13 chain and the hydroxypropanoyl moiety 
here on the north part of the molecule were formed. So how Tres approached this was to kind of first look into these purple genes and their annotations. And in green are the enzymes and proteins that we're going to mention today. In particular, one of those FAELs, fatty insulin P ligases that I told you about before, that also has an ACP domain that's not H, a ketosynthase, not G, and these two enzymes, not P, not P, that are involved in the methionine recycle. So the first experiment that Teresa did was to try to see if fatty acids or which fatty acids would be incorporated into inoculin using the same principle that I mentioned before, that you can feed these detritus fatty acids to cyanobacteria. They're not going to degrade them. So you will see the label ending up in the final products, in this case, inoculin A. That's what Teresa did. She supplemented this strain with either hexanoic acid or octanoic acid that had all protons substituted with detritus. She saw two incorporations of C6, but when she supplemented with octanoic acids, she saw a single incorporation. In this case, for example, two deuterons were lost, which is normal because there's reactions occurring with these fatty acids that involve the loss of deuterons. And then right. she just did MSMS analysis to figure out where the C8 moiety was coming in and where the C6 moiety was coming. Of course, you see two C6 incorporations here because C6 gets elongated to C8. And this label persists. So you will see C6 coming on this side of the molecule and C6 coming also on this side of the molecule. But with the MSMS analysis, she was able to show that the C8 moiety was coming from this left side of nodulin A. That was the building blocks for nodulin A, for the C13 chain. But we wanted to know which enzyme we're doing. First, we had to understand which enzymes were activating these fatty acids. There were two FALs in the bisynthetic gene cluster. Although one of them, not M, we expected them to be involved in chlorospheral actinide biosynthesis. In any case, there is a test of both NOC A, which I told you before, and NOC M. And she saw that only NOC H was able to efficiently activate both C6 and C8, which is quite unusual. Usually you have one FAL activating one fatty acid, the other activating another fatty acid. In this case, it seems like it's a single FAL activating both fatty acids that are used to compose that C13 chain of oxygen. So with that being shown, there's a generated this thioester, so NOC age connected to C6 and NOC age connected to C8 in vitro with an enzymatic acid. She also generated what we call ACP surrogates, which is versions that kind of mimic the pantothenate arm that's connected to the fatty acid, just to make it easier to perform in vitro assays, but they usually sometimes perform as well as the actual fatty acid connected to the enzyme. But in both cases, she tested it and she put this together with NOCCHI, which is the other enzyme ketosynthase in her test tube, and she saw the formation of these molecules. So this is the C13 beta keto acid that then we suppose gets decarboxylated to the C13, which is functionalized in this position. So this showed that NOC H activates two different fatty acids together with NOC G. These are condensed into the C13 chain that's found in NOC A. Looking a bit more into detail into this NOC G enzyme, we realized that it was a new kind of ketosynthase, different from other ketosynthase. The closest one was actually this PPYS, but the product that it generates is completely different. So NOC G, we can say it's a new ketosynthase that performs a non decarboxylative cleansing condensation. We think that the carboxylate is then lost probably continuously. So this is a new enzyme that can be used, especially in conjunction with NOC H to connect two different fatty acids. One interesting thing that I haven't put here in the slide is that although in the test tube you have C6 connected to NOC H and C8 connected to NOC H, when you add NOC G, you only have formation of the C13 chain. So you only have reaction between C6 and C8. You don't have 2C8 reaction or 2C6 reaction, which shows that this NOCG is quite selective, which is also relatively unusual for this ketosynthesis. Then we wanted to know where the north part of the molecule, the hydroxyphenyl, was coming from. And Teresa and the colleagues at Harvard realized that these enzymes were annotated as methionine salvage pathway enzymes. So she tested them in vitro and she saw that actually they had the kind of function that is attributed to their homologs that are known from methionine salvage. So they had the same activity. So they could be implicating the involvement of methionine in the biosynthesis of noctilinia. With both bioinformatics and vitro acids, there's a show that NOC A and NOC B are actually methionine salvage pathway enzymes, but they have the same activity. So the next step we thought of was testing whether methionine would get incorporated into noctilinate. 
So she did these documentations of the dream label methionine, carbon label methionine, carbon nitrogen label methionine, and she supplemented the modularity culture, which is one of the producers of not and there's others. And she did the supplementation, waited for days, did LCMS analysis, and she saw incorporation in the several cases. And with MSMS, she was able to pinpoint where the incorporation was. Basically, she showed that the origin of the north part of the molecule is not from fatty acids, but actually from time, which is also extremely unusual and will definitely help us in trying to figure out the rest of the biosynthesis. So to sum up this inoculin A story, two different fatty acids are loaded by NOC H and condensed by NOC G into a C13 alcohol chain. Well, actually a C13 beta keto acid that is the linear C13 alkyl moiety of moculin A. And then l gets incorporated into the north part of the molecule. These were the two examples I wanted to share with you. There's a couple more that we have found unusual things about fatty acid metabolism in, in the way they get incorporated into secondary metabolites, but they are not as recent as these two studies. I hope that you have noticed both the diversity of mechanisms that cyanobacteria use to modify fatty acids. Also, the, the uniqueness of the absence of bad oxidation, which is something we are studying currently with Taldegan, try to see what's going on with these, because it seems that they might actually have another way to degrade fatty acids. But what is actually quite interesting to me, and I think might be also interesting to this audience, is that it seems like because they don't degrade fatty acids as fast at least as, for example, the Elios organisms that have bad oxidation, they seem to be shuttling or they have been using them more frequently than other organisms into their secondary metabolism. And then they've evolved enzymes that are able to modify this alkyl chain, which typically are not as modified in other organisms. So it seems like cyanobacteria have been living together with these fatty acids in their secondary metabolites, learning how to modify them and creating functionality from that. And we are extremely happy to have found these mechanisms and excited to find others because I'm pretty sure that based on what we see in genomes, I'm pretty sure that there are many more out there. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Of course, my group, which did all the hard work and also funding from the European Union and from our national funding agency, FC. Thank you very much, and I would be happy to take any questions that you have.